everyone, welcome once again to Mentoring Developers. This is a podcast and YouTube show for you. If you are a new developer, if you want to be a developer, you don't know where to start, you don't know, you have questions, you don't have answers for those, and you'd like someone to just lay it out for you and tell you that you can do it and show you with examples. So today, my guest will do just that. My guest today is Richard Campbell. Richard is a podcaster. He is an architect, and I've been following him for many years. I've been listening to his podcast, .NET Rocks, and I know that he's involved in a lot of different things in a lot of different companies, and he has been doing it for far longer than, than, I, um, than I have been. But today, I want to start with the, with the interesting story that, that Richard was talking about earlier before with the show. He did something really crazy in order to get some tax credits from the Canadian government. And he started speaking or doing some of the activities that he's known for, not for the reasons you may actually think he, he did that. So I just want Richard to explain to us, what was that? What, what did you do for tax credits? Uh, well, I was, uh, I was a good old fashioned developer. This is the middle nineties, right? Uh, where Windows is in full swing, I'm starting to program in Visual Basic, migrating some old DBase apps into VB, and I uh, was the head of development for a marketing company. So, you know, not technology first company necessarily, but we were automating a lot of stuff, doing a lot of ad buys, doing a lot of statistical analysis, like really showing effective trackable marketing, which is good fun. And I had a couple of devs working with me. I did most of the IT stuff as well. So I was building out the machines and, and supporting infrastructure, helped build out the office and the data center for it. And uh, we hit a point where it was like, well, this is about as much money as the company's going to spend on development, even though there's a lot, you know, the list of software, the things you needed was very long. And so I was looking for ways to get a couple more people working. And the Canadian government has tax credits for sort of original creation. They want to encourage technological development in Canada. And so if you could demonstrate that what you were building was original art, then uh, you could get half of the wages that you paid out to develop that as a tax credit. And so, you know, talking with the ownership of the company, it's like, hey, if I can do this and get these tax credits, like, can I hire another person or maybe two? And they're like, sure, if you can pull it off, go for it. And so, and what we were writing was pretty original. Like it was a neat system. I was very proud of it. And, uh, but the way you created evidence was by being published. So magazine articles and uh, those kinds of things. And so I very clinically sort of went about, uh, how am I gonna write a magazine article that is credible, that is good? So I, I sort of read the articles that I like the best, the, my favorite magazines of the time, contacted them about how do you get published, not understanding the system in any way <laughs> at the time. You know, it, it, my view of it's very different now than it was then. And, uh, you know, the first article idea I had was on this printing engine that we developed to be able to do custom printed letters and envelopes ready for stuffing, classical marketing stuff. And that turned into like a six part series. And I got my text credits, like it worked out. But the byproduct of that was they asked me to do a talk on this sort of low level, how you interact with Windows and VB, right? And I was using Dan Appleman's book and so forth. And so it was like, okay, you know, that's good material for Sierra as well. Like this will all be good for the tax credits. And so then for the really first time ever, I got on stage to do a present technology presentation. I was a little nervous, but I watched a bunch of them and I sort of knew what I wanted to do. It was the applause at the end that surprised me. I didn't know that would appeal to me. That was a complete shock, right? I didn't know I would love writing and I didn't know that I would love presenting. I did them for the tax credits and then turned into, wow, that's really fun and really interesting. And so it just became part of my repertoire. Like you, and I was in my early thirties, married two kids and blew up my career essentially at that point. Like that, oh, how do I do more of that? It meant I couldn't keep working for the marketing company. That made no sense. Like I just completely revised my career. I don't know if that's good advice, but <laughs> You know, I would make the point that you don't know what you don't know, right? Like if you don't go out and try these things, right. uh, you have no way of knowing. And I've mentioned this before in other conversations that, 
you don't have to be a speaker to have a successful career. Like the normal response to public speaking is sort of a fear and loathing response. And I'm all for facing your fears, but that gets you up doing it once. After that, if it doesn't work for you, let it go. Like there's other ways to grow your career. You don't have to do a thing you hate and you're never going to be right. great at something you don't like. You know, I, my passion for that came out of, you know, the physiological reactions that I had to it. And then I studied it in earnest for years and still do. This is great. So things happen when you take initiative. You, mm -hmm. you had an idea. You weren't thinking too, too far ahead. You weren't saying, okay, I'm going to do this. Then this is going to happen. Then that's going to happen. Then that's going to happen. Eventually, I'm going to be famous and go tour the world <laughs> and speaking. But you did something and that opened another door and then it opened another door. And that comes with experience. When you are just starting out, if you are a 20 year old, you are looking for your first job or maybe your first internship. Mm -hmm. You don't know this. So this is where experience comes in handy. This is why I think mentorship and mentorship in the software space is so important because then we can actually learn from you. And, and maybe someone that's listening to this podcast right now can say, oh yeah, maybe I should try this opportunity that came into my inbox or someone was mentioning it, it at a meetup, but I was like, yeah, I, I, what's the point? But maybe after listening to this, they'd be like, let's try. What's the harm? And then, yeah, and, and and what's the goal? Part of it is just that base knowledge, right? Right. You don't have to decide now, hey, I want to be a world-class speaker and go off and do that. A, it's, that's pretty hard to do and pretty unlikely. But the worst thing is deciding that's a ladder you want to climb, getting to the top of it, not liking the wall it's leaning against. Try it. Don't You don't need to make a huge commit, right? There's a local user group you can take a, take a spin on with a lightning talk for 10 minutes. And if that is appealing to you, do an hour. You know, these are all volunteer gigs and they need your help. So you're benefiting a system as a whole, as well as exploring the potential of your own career. Yeah, that's But I, absolutely right. Yep. I don't see that as a career goal either. You know, when I think about the people that I'm most impressed by in technology, mm -hmm. they're folks that go off and do the work and then come out and talk about it for a while. Right. And then they go back and do the work. You can't just be... Uh, telling the stories all the time, right? Like that being said, like what I've done with my career around .NET Rocks and so forth is as a researcher, right? It is gathering knowledge for folks to be able to disseminate it, you know, normally from other people. So I, but there's a time when I'm not recording, lots of times when I'm not recording and I'm mostly reading and studying what the folks are working on and where things are going and getting briefings about different product stacks. Like there's all that work behind the scenes in DNR that allows us to right. help with the narrative of where the .NET development community is going. Right. So in terms of what a new developer should be looking at, so I'm thinking of someone who is just starting out. Maybe they mm -hmm. got their first job. Maybe they are studying computer science or maybe they're starting liberal arts and they're like, you know, there, there's no job for me. Let's maybe I can do something else that is a, is better for my career, or maybe I can get an internship. Or I have a friend who has a company, and they they're looking for somebody. I don't know if I should be doing this because this is a commitment, and I don't know if I'm yeah. cut out for this. You know, maybe I'm not smart enough. I, I'm not a math major. There are lots of people have these feelings. I've I've met so many people that would come to me and say, well, they need to get this computer science degree first. They need to do this and this and this. Then they are going to, you know, start looking for jobs or start working on it. And I, when I tell them, you don't need to do that. You can just do it. No, you don't yeah. need any permission. And and you can just do it on your own. And, and people will actually hire you without a degree. I see some resistance some, from some people they well, and like the worst part is the ones who do commit to doing those degrees and then can't get a job either, right? Mm. The, the, the real thing you need to know about computing is it's still not a profession, actually, right? You're trying mm. to compare in your head a software developer to a lawyer or an architect or a doctor, true professions. 
in the sense that you are not allowed to use that title. In fact, in some cases, it's a criminal offense to use that title until you have those qualifications and right. a qualifying board has said, yes, you're now a lawyer, you pass the bar, right? Or, you know, that's reality. There is no equivalent in computing yet. There may be someday, but today it doesn't mm -hmm. exist, right? We're seeing more degrees in computing, but we don't have the profession element, which is, a certifying body right. that identifies you as a qualified developer and then takes responsibility for you, takes on liability for you. Mm -hmm. right? And as long as that piece is missing, no amount of paper qualifications are actually going to matter. It's not how developers get hired. Right? That's not the method that's actually used. It's why we see the hiring of developers as such an arcane art, because there isn't a right way. So you have to find your way, find the things that matter to you, figure out the or what organizations care about and make sure you hit those metrics. There's not one right way to build a, a software development career or to get hired by any given company. It depends on the business and how they do their hiring. So can you say if that a person who wants to be a software developer or they're trying to see, am I cut out for this? A certain type of person qualifies or is good at it do you need to be super analytical or mathematical organized? What do you really need? How do you evaluate yourself to see if you should be doing this? And that, you know, it's the funny part about that is the same, I may have just said something really nasty about software development there. And it, believe me, it's not. Because here's the upside. Mm. There's a lot of ways to have a great career in software. Looks like we have uh, some connectivity issues. Let's see. Do there's programming work that you can do for them. And if you have uh, a mind that's more oriented towards people and more oriented towards work processes or any of those things, each of those things help in making great software. You just got to fit yourself into the different roles. I think that's where why we see so much internship in software. It's not like interning as an architect where the path is clearly defined. The big thing with internship is an opportunity to try different development experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, PM a project where you're more involved with the users trying to understand the requirements gathering and helping to organize and supervise developers. Do an internship as an engineer where you're given a clear set of, uh, of tools and, and a, an approach to building things. Try these different methods. See what works for you. What what turns you on? What gets you excited? That you want to do more of that, and also recognize that none of those things are permanent commitments. Most successful software careers that I've seen change several times over the course of that career. Maybe they spend some time in engineering first, and then ultimately it's like you kind of built the things that matter to you. So you're more interested in helping others be successful with building it, or you know you've. You're looking at that broader view of software development and an architectural role makes more sense to you that the nitty gritty is less exciting. And then you may switch back. You know, I've watched folks spend time in engineering, build, a, you know, for a couple of years, then gone over and supervised projects for a couple of years and then gone back to engineering again. That's true because there are so many opportunities. What I notice in my experience is opportunities keep coming up. As your company mm -hmm. grows, <laughs> they hire a whole bunch of people, and all of a sudden, those people are newer than you, even if you may be two years ahead of them. And then all of a sudden, we need someone senior to mentor them or to to watch over them, so people move up. It, and seniority comes fast in the computing industry. It it know. does, and I've I've seen people go from complete beginners in two years to be managers <laughs> in small companies. Sure. Uh, it happens in certain technology stacks and in some other places it doesn't work like that. But you can actually switch. You're saying that someone could be a developer and then they could get into architecture where they're not actually necessarily writing all the lines of code, but they are thinking about the big picture and how all the systems interact with each other. Some people go from development into quality assurance or testing or mm -hmm. back and forth 
and there's many paths and, and industries. You can have the same role. You can you can be a developer uh, doing WordPress apps, or in other company you could be doing Java. You write may, maybe writing Java server side code, and they're completely different from the way sure. in the I've way that I've seen wildly successful teams of mobile game developers that are four people and make a very comfortable living. And and that they also recognize that that's a work style they like. A small team of close friends who work together every day. As and there is no promotion path. Right. right? There you know, what did you want from your career? Do you need a title and a, a big office and things or do you just want to code with your friends and make a living from it? I mean, all of those things are possible. The startup community is a different way of working, too. We still have emerging technologies in computing that could make brand new companies that can lead to stunning amounts of, of, of wealth at much higher risk. Right. Yeah. So entrepreneurship is a path, obviously, where mm -hmm. you could create a company where you could help other other companies. You can say... I will do that for you if you don't have that resource and I can be that for you and I will charge you a certain number of certain amount of money per hour or per project. You could also work at a startup company that's building a thing. Now, it may be an obvious thing for a lot of people what I'm describing, but a lot of people they they may not know that's a possibility. Like a lot of startup companies with uh, with funding, you work there, you after for a certain number of years, then after that, you have stocks or shares, and you could actually. Uh, that's a different path. It's a sure. corporate developers. You can work for a J.P. Morgan Chase or a big health health provider, and you could be writing applications that are just doing some internal things. You could be right. So there's there's so many jobs. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, for and a, the growth of jobs continues, right? Like right. The reality in IT to this day is we're running around with 15 to 20% of jobs continuously unfilled. Not that we never fill those roles, but new roles appear right. faster than we can fill them. Absolutely. So there's opportunity, which, which sometimes choice is overwhelming. So yeah. if you can put yourself in the position of a a new developer, someone who's just starting out, they don't really have someone to look up to or they don't really know who to talk to. And they, they come to you and say, Richard, I don't know what I should follow. I don't really have a particular preference because I don't have the experience. What's your advice? What should I go? What should I do next? Yeah, I tend to encourage folks to try things. Okay. To find opportunities. Now, you've also got to look at your life as well. Can you afford to experiment? You know, most dev gigs are going to run you six to 12 months, no matter what. Uh, even if the company's brand new, you know, there's generally enough money to at least go that far. Even if it's not a career that makes sense for you, if you put six months into it, then realize, okay, well, this is not working for me. It's not working for them. Those are all learnings, mm -hmm. right? So the opportunity to get out there and explore, knowing as many opportunities as there are, the challenge is, can you get good at getting hired? So can you learn to interview well? Can you get good at the job searching parts, which it can be a little soul crushing, you know, the <laughs> how, where do I, you know, going onto the job boards, getting out to, to user groups and finding out what work opportunities are out there. They're all pretty tough. And if you've got to make rent, you right. know, if you're just trying to, to, to keep your head above water, you don't have a lot of room for that. You take the job that'll pay you enough to function. The problem is, do you settle for that or do you save a little time? in your, your year for how do I grow my career still? You know, the, the reality is this is very much like bicycle riding. There's two things you gotta do. You gotta pedal and you gotta steer, right? You've gotta manage your career and you've gotta lead your career. Most of the time, you're gonna manage your career. You're pedaling. But if you never steer, you never get to go where you wanna go. So you need a certain amount of time Maybe it's a week or two a year when you take some vacation that part of what you do in that vacation time is you think about what do I want for my career? A lot, I'm heavily involved in conferences, as you probably know. And one of the things I look at in my conference, especially and, and, and in others, is a lot of the people that are there, that's their week 
to lead their career. Yes, they're learning some new things. They're also talking to other people and they think about where am I going? Am I pointing the direction I want to go in? At the end of this week, I'm going to go back to pedaling. But if at least I've got an idea of a direction I want to go in, I can start to shape my career. Now the question is, is there a path forward for me in the place that I'm at or do I need to find another place? And you'll see a lot of folks that, that get good at getting hired moving around from place to place. Like it's a, It is a way to accelerate your career, to do a new place with a new role year over year. The talent they've cultivated is finding the opportunities and succeeding and gaining those opportunities. Then they spend the year doing them. The question is, are they also good at the work? Because when I see someone who's in a different role every year, my, you know, my question is like, tell me about these experiences. Did you deliver value? You know, why did you move on? I'm going to ask those questions. And I'm not saying they're bad. I don't automatically discard someone who's trying something every year. I just recognize the personality. You know, for me as a hirer, I'm saying it looks like you're going to last a year here because it seems to be what's happened before. Is that sufficient for me? Like, am I going to get enough value from you? It takes time to learn the domain you're working in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no downside to that per se, as long as you're in for the whole cost of that. You know, you can have a very successful career staying in a place that allows you a career path. And some people aren't driven to constantly get promotion either. It's like if my bills are paid, I have a life outside of work. What I'm looking for from my job is my bills are paid. Right. And the reality is that software generally plays very well. It's relatively rare to find someone who's struggling to get by on a, on a developer's wage. You know, and pretty quickly you get into Daniel Pink's drive that the money's not the motivator. Right. Once the basics are covered, once you can put food on the table, once your rent is good, then the other things arise and they, you care more about your autonomy, your mastery and your purpose. Are, am I able to work on the things I want to work on? Am I able to grow my skills and am I able to work on something bigger than a paycheck? Right. And that's really, really sage advice. I learned a lot from this. Um, I think the way you're you're putting it, uh, inspirational. So now what I'm thinking about is, as a new developer, I think this is good. I need to know, I need to know what you just described. You can switch jobs and that's, you can work up your, the ladder very fast. You can have more salary. You can, you can have a better title if you switch jobs constantly because then you have the the best leverage to negotiate. Uh, if you stay at one place, you, you become probably pretty good at a domain, but you probably won't advance as fast. That's good. But now it that It depends I'm, on the organization. Like I've seen places where they recognize that right. domain expertise is so valuable that if you are a mover, if you want to try new things, right. they're willing to put you in new roles every year. Depends on the organization. Very good. I think that those organizations are, are really, really good. And if 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 my listeners are, uh, if you if you're listening right now and you find yourself in those those companies, I I would encourage you to stay and explore that because moving within the company is is much easier than going and starting over because you don't know the people. Depending on what you're good at, you know, <laughs> I've met folks that have a knack for getting hired. Like, that's what they're good at. If wow. you get good at the interview, you have a superpower, right? <laughs> like, if you cannot, if, I'm going to spend 25 minutes with this person, and at the end of it, they're going to be, we need this person in our organization. Like, that's an interesting skill. And I've seen folks that are great at that. Wow. So, you know, you got to kind of figure out who you are. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and a lot of, um, especially in the West Coast, where the interviews are kind of all very similar in my, in my, personal experience, algorithmic. And if you're really good at solving algorithms on a whiteboard, you might be able to just get a job very easily in those uh, type of environments. I think in the Midwest, it's not really like that. We, uh, the, the interviewing process is, is a little bit more conversational and not so... Absolutely. We care very much about, are you going to work well with a team? Right. right? Are you going to fit into my, our team? I think you, you find organizations in, in certain parts of the world where... Most people are long life, long termers. They stay for a long time, and so your ability to function that relationship is incredibly important. And they're going to measure that first and foremost. It's like, can you work well in this team? 
because skills can be acquired, but it's much harder to change someone's ability and an approach to socialization. That is true. Okay, so in terms of visibility, now you must probably be in a position that you're you're hiring people or you're advising people who are looking to hire people. So do you go and look at their LinkedIn profile first to see what they're about? Do you really pay attention to their resume or their cover letter or references? What is the most important factor for you? Yeah, I, I think especially when we talk about tech careers, like you better have a LinkedIn. We're tech <laughs> people after all. Yeah. And your resume is one thing, but you know, the way you list stuff in LinkedIn, it, it's the public aspect of that. In some ways, I feel like what's on LinkedIn is almost more honest than what shows up in the average resume. Certainly is fresher. You know, the tooling is good at sort of pushing on, on the freshness. And, and but I've also been very, you know, when I see someone refreshing their LinkedIn, it's like, ah, getting ready to change your career, huh? Okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those things show as well. Um, but there isn't, a, you know, I don't, I don't want to say any set path for any of this. If you're really looking for a new career opportunity, the bombing randomly out of I'll take any job is never going to work for you. Hmm. What do I look for when I'm hiring someone? That they're interested in where they're working. That they want to work for, that they want to work in this place. And conversely, you know, when you want to get hired somewhere, do the research, know who the leadership is, know how the company makes money. You know, for the most part, when we're writing software, we're not on the line, right? We're not the people making the money for the company. We're typically building the tools that help the people that make the money. If you want to impress a business owner who's trying to decide if you're going to be of value to his company, know what's valuable to his company that how they what their lines of business are what the important pieces are and then you can ask important you know relevant questions like you know where do you see automation helping your business and actually understand the lines of business they're using and why automation would help there and they that to me speaks far more volumes right it works this works both ways this uh, you know autonomy right. mastery purpose are you signed on to the purpose of this company do you know what it is is it apparent you know, do you see right. how we work and what level of autonomies we expect? Do you see a space for improving your skills or, or pressing yourself to a limit? This is good. So w when I go for these interviews, or I have had, I have been in positions of when I'm hiring people. Also, I've been in positions where I'm looking for jobs. What I'd like to do is to is to evaluate the the company. That's as an in, as an interviewee who is looking for a job uh i'm more concerned about is this company right for me so mm -hmm. when i and, and i'm thinking in my mind at least i'm going there to see if this is the right company for me and not the other way around where i want to please this the interviewer to get the job because obviously that's a given that's going to happen but my concern is <laughs> am i going to get into trouble if i get there so i end up asking sometimes more questions than they ask me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I've noticed that interviewers are not prepared. So they're, they start the interview, they're like thinking what to say. So I say, can I ask a question? And they're usually relieved like, oh yes, yes, ask me while I think. So I ask them questions and then that leads to other questions. And then slowly we, we get into, you know, they ask me questions because by, by that time they had the chance to look at my resume. That's been my personal experience. So mm -hmm. this is what I recommend to to developers as they give go for interviews. They should really research the company and they should really have a they should really have an opinion of what they do so that they can ask questions. What's uh, what's the work? How do they work? Uh, what's the team structure like? What kind of projects they're working on? Because that's going to be your life, right? Yeah. You can also, I mean, think broadly about this. Do you like working here? Right. Like it's, because if they don't, there may be a reason why. And it may, you know, I've met interviewers that are clearly loathing what they do at that moment. Like they did, it's like you drew the short straw to do the interview. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's an interesting conversation to have about, oh, apparently they put, 
square pegs in round holes here. Like, why wouldn't you put a person into an interview role that wanted to be in that role, that was keen to fill that role? You know, and that the other great question is, what are you looking for? I mean, what are you hoping for in 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 an interview, and and in a, in a new employee? Like, what what's the ideal case here? You know, could I fill that? Could I not? You know, there's an honesty to that, but it's also just breaking down that wall of we're playing this game. Right. You need someone, or you wouldn't be interviewing because it's hard work, and I have things, and I I want to do some work. The question is, do we care enough about each other in the process? Do you care about the company? Do you care about work, how it works? Does it matter how this person works within that organization as well? Like all of those things are relevant. And and if you actually get to that, well, the interview goes really well. You're you're both the same people, right? You're both in the same situation. You work he works for the company too. Right, right. And you're going to be colleagues. So you want to make sure that um, both sides are th- I think looking for good colleagues too. I'm going to be working with this person. Uh, do I want to work with this person, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a two-way street. This is really good. So in terms of getting noticed, or let's say that there's a company in town that you want to work on and you you have a couple of years experience, nothing too special, and you find this great building, you're like, I'd like to work there. So how do you go about this? You can actually see what if I can just apply, go to their website, apply for a job and wait for a call. Or you could say, let's see if I can make a connection with somebody there, maybe find somebody on LinkedIn that works there and try to talk to them and see if we could, um, if we can talk about the, the culture. So, and then somehow do something so that you can get in front of the hiring manager through, uh, kind of an indirect route instead of going through the the recruiter. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a firm believer in the networking side of things. Mm. If there's a company that really excites you, the first, my first question is why? Because you must know something about that company right? for them to be excited you. Is it just a straight up brand recognition thing? You know, I've met many folks over the years, like uh, someday I want to work for Microsoft. And they may not know anything about the inside of Microsoft, yeah. but it's the brand Microsoft that gets them excited. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's something that they've dreamt about, for better or worse. But the more you learn about the company, you know, I would ar- ar- argue the goal should be to burst the bubble. Go find the ugly bits of the company, too. Right. right. At least, you know, see it as a whole thing. Just like interacting with people, we have our good parts and our bad parts. And the better you understand that spectrum, the better off you are. Hmm. But certainly the out of channel exploration should not be trying to be tricky and bypass the process, but rather gathering more information. Oh, look, this company that fascinates me is has got a booth at an event. I'm going to go and hang and visit their booth and see what they're like. You know, does it lead to a job? Perhaps it's not your primary driving force, but you're just doing your research first. You know, and they may, depending on the type of organization, they may drive you back to channels for hiring or they may not. You don't know. You, you've got to spend time getting to know them. Maybe they are better at network hiring. Maybe they've got a employee recruitment program where there's a spiff involved when employees bring great people into the company. You know, getting plugged into that where you're actually working with us, you're not being tricky you're actually working within a system that exists. They've decided that referrals are a better way to find great people. And so you're actually helping by plugging into that referral system. Yeah. I, a lot of companies that I've worked at, they do prefer referrals because they find that they get better candidates that way. But uh, but I, every company is different. So mm-hmm. yeah, th- definitely something to explore. The other thing I was thinking about is what technologies this is 2021 Mm -hmm. and uh, the world is a little bit different we're working from home and uh, that possibly restricts our opportunities but also maybe widens it now we can potentially work for anywhere else Uh, we can live wherever we are and and work for any employer anywhere anywhere in the world so many options um, I, I think the restriction part comes from the, the way that we network is challenged, right? We're not, for, at least until the vaccines and all of our arms, we're not going to be doing a lot of in-person meetings right now. We're not doing, 
conferences the same way. And so the social aspect of networking is impaired. It's challenging to really do all that. But as you said, I'm like, the work from home thing's not going away. And so you do have more flexibility in that respect. How you make yourself visible, the kinds of contributions you can make, say to open source projects or to related technologies to companies that, that interest you. That's an interesting approach. Uh, and there are many opportunities to, to, to write and to present and to communicate in a, a variety of forms. And I'm not gonna tell you that any one, one of them is the right way to go, but if you like an organization that persist, participates heavily in a, in a different in a various kinds of communities, being a part of that community helps you be visible. Again, it's these are very targeted behaviors that do you, I like that company. This company likes this thing. I should at least try that thing because <laughs> if I don't like it, maybe I'm not as attached to that company as I thought. Right. But if it does resonate with you, if you do have shared values with that organization, all the more reason that you should be a part of it. Yep. Makes perfect sense. So in terms of, there's no, in terms of technology, th there is no formula. You can do .NET, Java, you can do Ruby, you can do WordPress or PHP. There are opportunities everywhere. There's opportunities in all of those stacks, right? Like right. that's the thing is like, is there a one right way? No. There is I, I right will way. tell you a couple of things, advice that I've given over the years about okay. stacks in general. One is, there is an advantage to being early to a stack if that stack takes off. Right. That you will be on the curve of one of the most experienced people in that stack. Jumping into .NET today with the better part of 20 years of .NET being around, what's the upside? Product's incredibly mature. Training materials are plentiful. There's a demand for people with that skill set. So the job opportunities are broad. You know, now pick something more leading edge, something newer, say Flutter for mobile development, which I think is a very cool technology or some of the virtual reality and augmented reality techs that are still emerging. Can you get work in that space? Do you have the opportunities? Can you build up your skills and learn how, and learn to get that? You don't know if Google's going to kill Flutter. Google's notorious for killing technologies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. That's a little frightening. Now, not that building things there and having that technology no longer be supported means all your code explodes. It's not true. But nor does the skills that you cultivated there go away. But there's lots of folks who've fallen in on a stack early on and stayed with that stack over a long period of time. And when that stack is no longer the hot new thing, when it's become an established product, then the number of opportunities may diminish, but now your skill set comes to play, that you're the experienced one. And so new people may not be coming in and you're still essential. So, you know, the most extreme example of that right now would be COBOL developers. You know, a technology mm -hmm. largely developed in the early 60s, needless, needless to say, it has evolved. But you now have people who work their entire careers in COBOL, still in demand, Unable to retire because they keep offering them more money because you can't get new COBOL developed, <laughs> right? And yeah, they're trying to migrate off those stacks, but they haven't. So you can stick with a stack through your career if you picked the right stack. As long as you can deal with the fact that its perception of the market will shift over time, your opportunities should continue to function in one way or the other, right? And there's lots of stacks that are shrinking these days, but for those experienced folks, there's as much work as they want to do for as long as they want to do it. Perhaps maybe you don't like that. Maybe the new thing appeals to you more. And so right. being able to move from stack to stack and being ready to take, to consolidate your past skills, to right. inform new ones and to change your viewpoint on software development with a new stack over time, you know, that as a way to work as well. It's a question of what makes you happy. You know, do you, do you like the new thing? Do you like right. not knowing the answer again? as opposed to when you spent a few years or something, and generally you knew the answers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sometimes we're forced into rebooting that. It's like, oh, I'm not prepared to change companies, but the company's not going to continue development on the stack. I have to retread. Right. And, uh, you know, are you, are you up for that? Or is it better to change to a company that's sticking with the, your old stack and take all that experience with you? Or, you, you know, you're better to retrain. And if you're willing to retrain, do you want to retrain elsewhere? You know, you, you have, those are all leadership moments. That's the time to go to a conference and 
look at new things and think hard about where you're going with your career. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to take that on. Yeah, this is great. There are so many options and you have the choice of sticking with a set of technologies and becoming the expert, right? Or in a domain, or you can actually keep an eye on the cutting edge and have your skills be in demand. What I've, what I've noticed is that a lot of companies, a, a lot of people rather, they, they don't like to change. But as you mentioned, the, the company changes or the technology changes. So .NET right now, .NET is moving to .NET Core. And so there is a shift and I'm sure that there is, a, there is some resistance from some companies and some folks who, who were not used to that change. And Sure, but, and you understand, Microsoft didn't make that change for fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like this cross-platform a pro an open source approach was there uh, of they believed is was represented an existential threat if we don't do this we are going to be relegated to the dustbin of history that the focus was no of the company was no longer to be on the operating system but on the cloud and so it fundamentally shifted whether its customers did or not so if you're still working in a windows only company the things that microsoft's done the past few years seem bizarre <laughs> they're doing things that don't matter to you. If you if your company's happy with their own data centers on premises with virtual machines and Windows desktops, a lot of what Microsoft's done in the past five, six years, what? Well, who cares? Right. And then, of course, outside of that bubble, there is a different world going on that is right. working in the cloud and where the actual operating system is less relevant. It just runs on whatever device you have that we, mm -hmm. we no longer have a consistent form factor for devices. Sometimes it's a phone, sometimes it's a desktop, sometimes it's a laptop, sometimes it's a tablet. And someday there may just be a pair of glasses. Like we, <laughs> we're seeing new innovations in the UX space right? and it's pressing against what's possible. Right. And I think that's what's exciting about software in general, because software keeps evolving. New technologies mm -hmm. keep getting invented. New ideas keep coming in. So it, in my opinion, that's my personal opinion. You can disagree with that, Richard. But if I'm starting out right now, I would want to be on the new wave or maybe some, something that's coming out. And I can predict that that's going to be very, very important in the next two years. And I, I get excited by new technologies because new technologies, as you said, they don't just come out in, in a vacuum. They have been invented because there's a problem with existing technologies. And the, the way the world is changing, new technologies support us. So I like, to, I like to be with a new wave because then I'm doing something better. Usually that's my experience. And so, so you go and you do the new thing on your own time because your employer wouldn't be doing that necessarily on your own time. You do that new thing, you learn it. And, and then maybe you create a project of your own or you move to a company where they're doing that project. And that way you're now all of a sudden in a, a span of months or a year or so, you could be the expert in that field. I feel that that's, that puts you in a better place where you can actually take the conversation and move the conversation forward and, and I, f I find that to be inspirational. Yeah, so. it depends on what you like. You know, if again, if I see very happy web forms developers out there, Arslan, right? Like <laughs> that they they got on the, the web forms bandwagon in 2005 and 15, 16 years later, they're, they are senior in their organization. They're maintaining a plethora of applications that are important to their company and they're having a great career. They're content. And right. They see no reason to move. Their company sees no reason to move for one of those things, and good for them. But yeah, there are some interesting technologies, and and it's challenging to sort of rank them. Like I think augmented reality is a bit too far out right now. Right. The number of opportunities are low. We still haven't even gotten through the sort of trough of disillusionment on what that technology can do yet. Where I think predictive analytics and business intelligence systems have shown their value. Right. You know, we we were in a challenging time this past year with the pandemic and it's sort of shaken up computing 
because for more than a decade, we were pretty much just enjoying innovation, right? Make new things or the pressing against the AI stacks. Like it was kind of a blue ocean time. But when you hit a downturn like the pandemic has generated, the senior leadership, your finance guys, they're all looking at the bottom line more carefully. They're not saying they're not going to spend money. They just want to be sure of the return on that money. And so the projects become more conservative. Uh, and, our, and so uh, someone who's clever with their career, you know, this past year should have been really looking hard at is what I'm building big on the bottom line of the company. Does it make the company money? Even more, and even easily as important, saves the company money, which right. software is good at. You know, really software can do two things for an organization. You can either more, fewer people do more things. So we go run the machine faster mm -hmm. for less cost or measure it more precisely so that we find new opportunities in it. And that whole predictive analytics, BI space, all of that is about better instrumentation, deeply understanding the business. You know, if you've got the nerve to press to senior leadership to work hard on an analytics project that reveals a new line of business that represents a substantial increase and can come to the company, well, that's a leadership role. Like that's a promotion waiting to happen there. You've taken the domain experience you've had, your technical skills, you pressed against the edge of them and you find new opportunities for company in a challenging time. Yeah, that's that's how VPs are made, man. Like, but that's combining a bunch of different skills together at the same time. Yeah, I need your technical skills to even be able to evaluate this technology in a meaningful way. I need the experience you've had in the company, that domain experience, to know these are the important lines of business. This is the opportunity space. And then your personal skills. Were you able to persuade? Were you able to lead to get to a point to create something that makes a difference in the company? None of that stuff's for free. You need to cultivate all of those skills to be able to pull that off. The only, and then the timing needs to be right. And then, you know, that's why I'm talking about it now because for a long time, you know, since the great recession in 2008, 2009, the run coming into 2020 was very much a growth, try new things, experiment, a little less sensitive to the bottom line. But 2020 brought back that bottom line thinking again. And, and if you can do the math on knowing what the value of your software are, you're a more valuable employee. That's great. And valuable employees um, tend to make more money and tend to move up the, the ranks. Um, tend to end up with options, tend to end right. up in leadership roles. Like, you know, when I'm an employer and I find someone who deeply values this company and brings substantial value to them, I'm trying to find ways to lock them in. And paying them more is not it. Right. Right. <laughs> so I'll start associating their return their uh, results from the company with the company's success. That's what a stock option ultimately is, mm -hmm. is as long as the company value goes up, these options are worth more. Right. Right. It's a way for me to tie someone's success to the success of the company and have them inclined to make the company more successful and to stay. This is good. So lots of options for you out there if you're a new developer if you want to be a developer this is an exciting time right richard yes if you're focused on the right things and you find a place that you can excel there's lots of opportunity here even in a downturn you know even in downturn, the jobs might yep. be fewer those who know how to make companies more productive and more successful are going to do well that's great so what advice do you have for, uh, we've been giving advice constantly, but <laughs> do you have any other advice? Let's just put it that way. Do you have any other advice for new developers, especially people who don't have a history? Maybe they never went to college or maybe they don't know anybody who is in tech and they're like, I don't know, I'm not one of those people. I, I, I can only do this you know, service industry work, but I'm, I'm not very well educated. Maybe I'm just only high school. I feel like I'm not cut out for this. There are lots of different people. Is there anything you can say to them? Well, the, I mean, the good news is the internet is around and there's educational resources abounding. Right. So there, there's really no excuse to not be able to educate yourself for a relatively low cost. A plural personal subscription is $20 a month. You know, for that, you have access to some of the best minds that exist and plenty of free online resources as well if you're willing to scrape through them all and sort of sort the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. So you can teach yourself. 
There are very few, and there's nothing better than to actually teach yourself and then make things. There's no substitute for being a developer than developing. <laughs> it doesn't have to be for pay, right? It can right. be an open source project. It can be uh, a, a contribution to existing projects. It can be an idea you've had. But if you want to, how does someone know you're a software developer? They look at your software. Mm -hmm. Make some things, you know, and press against your skills while you do it. Try and make better things. This is also how you start to build relationships inside of an industry that if you start contributing to an open source project, one that's set up for beginners, because you'll see there's plenty out there. The sort of right. jump in tag in GitHub is about, hey, you new to this, never done it before? This is where you go. And if you talk first, code second, make some comments on an issue, offer to help, have conversation with folks, you generally find they're keen to help you. Right. You're the rare resource, the person with time willing to contribute to a project, that's insanely valuable, even when you're new. So being willing to do that opens doors, inevitably. Most developers are buried. There's so much work to do, we don't have the cycles, which means we're excited when someone has some cycles they're willing to share. Yeah, this is this is great. This is exactly how we feel as we get older and with more experience we get older, we may have more responsibilities and time is is becomes a rare commodity. Right? But, yeah. Well, and and you, so one of the things we watch closely is can you finish? Yeah. It's easy to start a project, tougher to get it done. That you is know, true. When you talk about the characters that we look for in in valuable developers is like and finished. Okay, so how do I show that I've finished something? So I can have a project on GitHub. Are you talking about having it? If it's a web project, let's make sure that it's deployed and then you've done all the, the work that you need to do to make sure that you can update it and uh, kind of more professional. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think so there's the element of finishing of have I built something just myself sufficient that another person could use it. Now, and I'm just talking about running the code. Right? It's not just a project just for you that somebody else can actually download uh -huh. it, follow the instructions, get it up and running on the machine. That's a great milestone. Right, That's finishing in one respect. Now, can I take up that project somebody else could contribute to it? They could understand where to contribute, that I would learn the skills and they would learn the skills to build a pull, or a pull and have a pull request accepted. You know, That's another level of finishing, of additional mm -hmm. contribution. Right, and, and from there, like, can you get to a point where you can have additional leaders in a project? So all of those things, and we, and we see examples of this, and they're typically done by accident. I look at a fellow like, like Jimmy Bogart, who's a lovely person, mm -hmm. uh, who I've known long enough that I can tease him relentlessly too. But, <laughs> you know, Autofac was not something he set out to make. You know, he needed it for himself. And the fact that it became an important open source project is sort of secondary to the point. It, it just sort of happened, and he had to learn all of those skills. Uh, and and succeeded in doing it, by the way. I think he's in a phenomenal leader of open source projects and 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 well respected for it. So there's examples out there to to look at and to ask. He's also incredibly approachable. You know, if you've got a problem trying to figure out how to take care of a project, there's, there's someone who'll give you some time for it too, and with all the credibility in the world because he learned it himself the hard way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've been following Jimmy Bogart for uh, for a few years while when I was learning uh, MVC. When I was first mm -hmm. learning MVC, he's he was doing a lot of work there, and and you mentioned Autofact, so uh, so that brings me to another question. I think that would be very helpful. Is there um, a few people, maybe a few resources that new developers can follow? Maybe if I follow these five people, I am going to learn a lot, or maybe I will be close to what's really happening in, in the cutting edge world of software development or anything like that? Are there people to follow that I usually now, don't, I don't ask this question? Right but... way. It totally depends on the industry too. Right. You know, if, if you're in the .NET community, I hope you're paying attention to Scott Hanselman. Right. Uh, he, he's a good thinker and a, and a, and a generous person towards anyone who who uh, wants to be in software mm -hmm. uh, and certainly same for scott guthrie who leads all of that stuff inside of microsoft what he says is inevitably important right why is it all scots right the new leader of dot net <laughs> is scott too many Hunter scots in microsoft too, right so yeah you know and Damian some... edwards and david fowler and like they, they it's not a simple list 
Yeah. But that's only if you're interested in .NET at its core. And I mean, and Hansel is more of a web guy. Right. Um, these days, it seems like Guthrie is more focused on AI than anything else. But that's because he's dealing with Microsoft's latest problems, not right. their past successes, too. Right. right? Where, and, and I mean, the upside for me as a guy who's made a couple of thousand podcasts is I, I have a lot of names at my fingertips. Right? I've just put a new show in the can for Julie Lerman around Entity Framework. Why? Is that Julie's written the books and done mm -hmm. the plural site videos? Like she's committed herself right. to deeply understanding and sharing about Entity Framework. So if that's a tool that's important to you, yeah. And the, the thing is, you don't need to ask me that list. This is imminently searchable. Okay. Right. To to look at where the book's coming from, who's still writing the blog posts, who's making the videos, like of the different stacks and technologies that are out there. So I don't, I can't say that I know the names of all of them. I think DHH, the Basecamp guy, mm. Heinemann, is is like uh, brilliant and lovely to read, right? And I think still think Joel Spolsky's stuff is is super relevant. Yeah, you know, Joel on software. They're, yeah, they're really important thinkers, and uh, right. but that's a broader look at at, at software right. and getting across all those different stacks. It's a lot of different places to to listen, right. you know. And I, I mentioned Flutter casually. Well, that's Tim Sneath, right? Like. Right. Yeah, if you care about mobile development and looking at that stack, you should probably be paying attention to what Tim's talking about. Right. So the way I approach this is that if I'm interested in an open source project, then usually there's an owner of that project or the main facilitator, like you mentioned, DHH, for that's yep. for Rails. But then if I'm looking at, uh, for instance, one of my favorite frameworks is Ember, the JavaScript framework. I know that uh, Yehuda Katz, he's a... Uh, the one of the main people behind it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm interested in that, then I can follow him. If I'm interested in .NET, obviously Scott Hanselman, anything that Microsoft is doing. And there are many other people that are at the forefront that if you follow them, you probably at least will hear the terminology that's relevant for today. I learn right. a lot about uh, front-end development from just following Yehuda Katz and, and some of the other people around Ember because what they do is they go and they see what other people are doing. And I don't know what, what the React developers are doing or the Angular people are doing because I can't really follow everybody. I just follow this one guy that I really respect and he follows everybody else and then he talks about it. <laughs> and so right. I'm... But yeah, and you're also, you're looking for that <laughs> aggregator, right? right? Right, That person who has consolidated that view. You know, and often the folks that are at the center of creating things right. are so busy creating them that they're not aggregators, right? They, they that's a different skill set, folks that it, that are good at taking a, a taste point. of the sense of the gestalt, as a part of the, so those core creators. And those core creators are important too, right? Right. You, not everybody you think about like a guy like right. like uh, Mads Targensen, who leads C Sharp. He's got right. a Twitter account, writes a blog post now and again. But leading C Sharp is a job, man. That's hard work. He's <laughs> yeah. a busy guy. Right. You know, he comes on my show for a reason. Mm. Because he when he does need to disseminate something, he, I'm a good vehicle for him in the form of right. .NET Rocks, right? He's not going to do all, all of those other things. And he's got great people around him. He's working closely with folks like Kathleen Dollard, who mm. I, do have great community connections and so forth, and are also excellent thinkers. So... You know, you're going to run into folks that are that are deeply immersed in technology, but may not be as visible. Yeah. And then you that, but and then you run across folks that are good aggregators that help to organize the the associations. That these are the the senses out there for this industry. Yep. So there's a lot to learn. That obviously, obviously, I am sitting here and I am actually standing, <laughs> I'm listening <laughs> to Richard, and I am learning a lot, as well as you guys who are watching and listening right now so we can go on and on forever but i want to respect richard's time and let's see if we can just close by by just learning a little bit more about what richard is doing where we can reach out to him and uh, ask for advice but i think he's going to be a great resource you know best way to reach me always is twitter uh the handle is rich campbell and uh and it's where i where i'll look the first so you're more likely to 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 see me uh, there. And I, of course, tweet out the shows and things that I'm making. Uh, the projects, I'm, I'm deeply immersed in trying to finish a book on the history of .NET. 
I hope 2021 will be the year, but I hope that 2020 would be the year. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenge, writing history, writing all the history down is hard work, but it's been really fun and I'm trying to get that done. Uh, Humanitarian Toolbox is a, a charity I helped organize back going back as far as 2012, where we build open source software for disaster relief organizations. We're in the middle of a new project, which I think is gonna start showing up on Twitch real soon now, called Two Weeks Ready. And so we are focused on helping people using their smartphones to get ready for disasters. Mm-hmm. And you know, we've all heard from our you know various government organizations about you should be prepared in, in the event of whatever the disaster is in your particular region. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so we care about earthquakes and tsunamis, but maybe you're in the tornado zone, uh, even severe weather warnings and so forth. And so, you know, they, they've reminded us that we should have kits of supplies and extra medicines and food for your pets and so on, and that you should make a plan that in the event of a disaster, where do you gather and so on. So what we're trying to do is build software to make that easier. So at its core, the idea is you're a family unit and everybody has a smartphone. So let's keep a set of data on that phone for a disaster. And that typically is gonna be, one person inside of that family unit is likely to do the organizing on that, that these are the phone numbers you need to know, this is where we should meet and so forth. So keeping all that information synchronized and stored on the phones, all peer to peer, so that in the event of a disaster, you don't have to go look it up, it's already in your phone. So we've been working closely with uh, a couple of different emergency response groups, and uh, preparedness folks and it's an open source project it's on github and we're always looking for contributors that's awesome so if you're looking for um, a project that you want to get involved in this is a great project not only that it's it's good but it it'll look good on your resume and you can say you worked with richard campbell (laughs) that's that's always that's always a nice I would not accept my pull request. Okay? <laughs> there are far better coders than me. And I'm not even, you know, Carrie has been leading that project. Uh, I am a professional cheerleader at this point in my <laughs> career. <laughs> yeah, this is great. And you also have a podcast and maybe I know that you um, are on .NET Rocks as a co-host, yeah. but you probably also have another podcast. The other podcast is Run As Radio, and that's aimed more at the IT folks. Mm. Although a lot of devs listen to it because they want to know what the IT folks are up to. <laughs> so that's uh, we we put out .dot net rocks every Thursday. Run As comes out every Wednesday, and uh, yeah, those 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 are a couple of things that I make on a routine basis. So you can expect podcasts from me at any given time. And then the Dev Intersection line of conferences is us as well. So we did some virtual stuff in 2020. We're looking to get back in person at some point in 2021. That's great. And on the screen, people can see the URL for this this website or this particular podcast. It's going to be mentoringdevelopers.com slash episode 94. And you can also see a ticker that tells you that if you want to ask a question, you can send me an email at us at mentoringdevelopers.com. If you want to know what are all these links the that Richard was talking about, you don't have to write it down. Just go to that web page, slash episode 94. You'll see the links and you'll see all the resources there. We'll put Richard's bio there and contact information so you can get all that. If you're watching this on YouTube, you, this should be on the YouTube description. So that's going to be good. Send me an email. And if you want me to pass something on to Richard, just send it to me. I'll pass it on. I also do these one-on-one Consulting sessions, like if you're starting out, you're not sure what to do, you have a thing, you have a problem, you can reach out to me. We'll see if we can help you there as well. So, Richard, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure, Arslan. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so much. And we'll see you guys later in the next episode. Bye for now. For show notes and transcripts, visit us at mentoringdevelopers.com. 